Robbie, how are you, brother? I'm really good, actually. It's nice to speak to you. Your, your empathy and your compassion really, really touched me. And before you pressed record, I asked you how you were, and you said, I'm, uh, I'm in paradise and it's all in there. I'm in content. I've got to content. How do you get to paradise? Pain medication is fucking evil. I think drugs are like the equivalent of a Ouija board and you don't know what you're opening up. And I think that when people talk about demons and sorting out their demons, I think they're actual demons. I'll tell you what though, it's a fucking field day for conspiracists right now, isn't it, with this that's going on. What I did straight away in this lockdown was rid myself of mainstream, the mainstream media news because I, I understood that it was inflaming my panic and paranoia and fear. Why all the symbolism? Everybody's saying, you know, this and and this and all of these things and Hollywood's in on it. It's not true. I'm in love with the planet. I'm in love with its people, which is weird because I'm an agrophobe. <laughs> the awakening is upon us or we're deluding ourselves yet again. Is there anything you don't want me to mention? No, 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 no. Let's, Let's mention, mention everything. everything. Okay. Robbie, how are you, brother? I'm really good. Today, I am really good. Um, it's nice to speak to you. Oh, mate, it's, it's wonderful. And um, you've already made my day. You sent me a really nice message this morning. And... Um, yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, it, I, your, your empathy and your compassion really, really touched me. And I'll tell you why. I was watching the SAS program. And, um, and then I went on YouTube to, I, I found you basically, and you were talking about the SAS program. Because there was the incident with um, John Fashionu and the incident with Tony Ballion. I also went on Twitter to see what people were saying and the amount of abuse that they were receiving because of their actions was quite phenomenal. And it scared me and it made me sad. And um, how, how you interpreted their life and their story and the empathy that you gave them is really crucial right now, just in general. So um, I thought I'd reach out to you and say I appreciated it. Oh, mate, I, I love you, mate. It's so kind. It's well, it's so kind you did that because it kind of validates what, well, who, who who I've become, and it's it's been a fucking it's been a long road, you know. It's been a long old. And I, and I asked you before you before you pressed record. Uh, I asked you how you were, and you say kindly. Your guests ask you how you are, and I always say the same thing. You said. I'm, uh, I'm in paradise and it's all in there. I'm in content. I've got to content. How do you get to paradise? Wow. God, this, we could probably talk for hours on this subject alone, Rob. Um, let me say, I, I don't think you can find I don't think there's any such thing as like being happy every day, right? I wish there was, it would be great if that was an end goal, you could just aim for that and one day you get there. And But I don't think you ever get that. Life is always gonna be ups and downs. And the way to live in paradise is how you interpret those ups and downs. So it's how you make sense of, you know, everyday incidents that might not be pleasant or, you know, or they might be the opposite, might be, might be um, delightful, but it's kind of like, like rolling with the highs and rolling with the lows, but staying in the middle. Um, I think I know, what you, I think I know what you mean. Cause I, the interesting thing that's happened for me in this lockdown is that, you know, there, there has been, um, we've got a lot of family issues right now. You know, my dad's got Parkinson's, 
Uh, my mother-in-law, who I love dearly, has got a um, uh, very big illness. Uh, we can't get to them. Um, my dad's thousands and thousands of miles away. My mum is just a year short of 80, and she's in isolation, and I can see the things whirling in her mind and her eyes going. Uh, we have a brand new baby, Bo. Uh, uh, well, we've got four children. And um, basically, all of these things that go into the computer can cause fear and panic. And um, I noticed at the start of the, the lockdown that um, I was going into fear. But the difference between me now as a middle-aged man and the person that I used to be, I saw it, said, that's interesting, tomorrow will be different. And it was. Whereas before, I understand a little bit about your history. If that would have happened, I thought, I used to think that I was going to feel that way for a decade. Mm. Yeah. Do, do, do you know yeah. what I mean? <sighs> Yeah, I kind of, I, I kind of do. It's no, I'm just talking about the 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 the, the riding of the wave, the acknowledgement of okay, this is happening now, but this too will pass. Tomorrow will be different. Oh, oh, massively, massively. I mean, it's like when you're coming down off drugs, and you've you know maybe you've lapsed or relapsed, whatever it is. It's it's you can feel absolutely awful. You can be chronically, maybe not chronic, but extremely depressed. Everything in your life um, feels like it's going against you. You feel that lack of self-worth, you, you, you feel unpopular, all those things that we feel on a come down, right? But when you get a bit of an old dog, you just go, hang on, it's, it's just all in my head. You know, it's just chemicals, isn't it, different? sort of um different chemical reaction going on in your brain and you can tell yourself hang on i'm not gonna tomorrow i'm gonna feel better day after that i'm gonna feel even more better the third day bang i'm gonna be firing again and that's kind of how i am with with everything now really i mean i'm a great believer in what bob marley said everything's gonna be all right and Somebody, a girl, it was a girl actually said that to me. I, I got off with this girl in South Africa. I was on my way to Mozambique to go and uh, teach street, uh, street kids. And uh, this was all after like my, what I'd call like the major part of my drug problem or my or addiction, I should say. And uh, for some reason I rocked up in this uh, backpackers in, God, uh, Johannesburg, yeah. And I met, I met this girl, and I don't can't remember how we got it on, but she had a bit of a crush on me, and she could see I was nervous about the upcoming. I think I had a flight the next day to, to Nampula in Mozambique, and then it was a, a chicken bus to go and meet these kids in this rural village where I'll be working for six months, and nervousness was nothing i'd ever experienced before drugs ever nervousness anxiety i only ever knew what that was after when i joined the marines you know i joined the toughest basic training in the world or passed the toughest basic training in the world I just took everything as it came rob you know right what we're doing today we're doing that right give it your best try and pass tomorrow's a new day da 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 it was when, um, you know, drugs, possibly a bad acid trip I had once. After that, I started to know what anxiety is and, and, and that kind of thing. And this girl moving forward to South Africa recognized that I was in an anxious state sort of thing. She just went, don't worry about a thing. Cause every little thing's gonna be all right. I'm singing to Robbie Williams. There you go. There's there's a tick off the bucket list. <laughs> nice. 
And um, do you know what? I just got it. I just, you know, I've got a lot of things at different stages over the year. And just the way she said that, it's like there isn't anything to worry about, is there? Everything usually is all right. If it's not, we just, we get on and deal with it. So, uh, See, I, I, um, I was different to you. I, I sort of took drugs to fill in the blanks, you know, and when fame came to me at a very early age, I was 16 when I joined Take That, it sort of magnified all of the negative aspects of who I thought I was. And uh, before that, I was quite content, but I was vulnerable and incredibly sensitive. And I felt like I'd, bore, I'd been born with an open wound. And then when I was thrown into this mosh pit of uh, show business, it intensified the negative aspects of my own self-doubt. So I took drugs to um, become the person that, I, that the world was telling me I should be. When really, you know, I'm a, an introvert uh, and it's okay to be an introvert. I'm an introvert with uh, extrovert tendencies. I'm an extrovert for a living, but I'm an introvert in real life. So um, I did know about anxiety. I did know about fear. And I did know about being scared and not being enough. Uh, and then it just intensified and got worse. And then, you know, you throw petrol on the flames uh, by ingesting what you ingest. So you say that when you were growing up, you didn't have that. And then what you became was a product of your addiction and self-abuse. Yeah, I wouldn't want to mislead people and have them think I didn't have any challenges grow up because without you know going too deep into it I had the archetypal uh, troubled <laughs> troubled childhood that's to put it mildly you know my parents separated several times ending in divorce I think I went to I think I went to six six schools you know, so that's six new sets of friends, six six new sets of bullies that you've got to fight so you don't get bullied, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, yeah, it was, like I say, I don't like to talk too much about it because I, I believe in forgiveness, but it was quite, um, you know, I went through, yeah, thing, yeah. I went through things, Rob, that, it, that, a, that a toddler shouldn't ever go through, right? Um but even off the back of that, even though that game that instilled certain character traits in me, like I, I, yeah, I was kind of extrovert looking for attention, but probably really introvert in in myself. I'm, I'm guessing you can relate to that. I wonder if um, the anxiety and the depression and the lack of self-worth and self-esteem for you was a sleeper cell. Do you know what I mean? It was there, but maybe you just blocked it out because of the uh, trauma of what happened to you. Gosh, let me think. I never, I never knew depression until I came back from Hong Kong. So for people watching who don't know, I, I left the Marines to run what was a fairly successful business in Hong Kong. It was turning over an awful lot of money at one point. So I just, I just assumed, leave the commandos, go to Hong Kong, make my fortune, just a little bit naive young man, really. But that's, you know, very capitalistic sort of thing. So within six or seven months I was chronically addicted to crystal meth my business had gone had, had gone pear-shaped and I ended up working as a nightclub doorman in a club over there run by the 14k triad crime family so things all got really you know uh quite interesting so I'm in full-on psychosis so 
best way to explain that is like I'm schizophrenic, you know, I'm in like a full on sort of schizophrenic mode while working for, a, for Hong Kong's most violent crime family. Um, it, it, it got a bit hairy and it got a bit not nice. But when I came back from there, I was back in the U. So I was in that kind of state for, let's just say, a, a year. When I came back to England and um, my family didn't recognise me, Robbie, you know, I walked up to my dad in the airport and I was like, all right, dad. And he's just kept, he's keeps looking at the arrivals, you know, tunnel. I'm like, dad, it's me. And he looked at me and his face just was just shocked. I'd gone out there sort of 13 and a half stone like bodybuilder and I was coming back best part of nine stone, you know? Anyway, I was fine for a few days. I I'd, I'd smuggled a little bit of crystal meth back with me, did a few lines of that over the um, next couple of days. And when it was gone, it was gone. And there was no like, you know, I wasn't desperate or anything, but I was fine, but there's a ma- there was a massive empty feeling in my life. I loved Hong Kong. It's so vibrant over there. It's it's just like being in your own kind of oh, can't really explain your own movie twenty four seven. Literally, I used to just dance all night, and then, you know I used to work on the door till two, three in the morning. Go over to my favourite nightclub, dance with a with a Filipino sort of domestic workers and and then uh, do the same thing again, anything up to nine days at a time without sleep. When I got back to the UK, I missed Hong Kong terribly. I missed the people, I missed the language, I missed the food, I missed the culture. I missed being a front man on a nightclub, um, as, as kind of bad as this might sound, but a nightclub run by fucking head cases, you know? Who, head cases who'd taken me in taking me in when I was homeless and sitting on my backpack on on the Nathan Road over there and when I got back to the UK I stopped the drugs I was fine for um like a few days it was almost like everything was back to normal and after a couple of weeks I got bored my family's telling me, Chris, take it easy. Take it easy. You've been for a hard time. And I'm like, no, I want to get a job. I want to get back over there as soon as possible. This was my thinking. Well, I never got that job. But what I did do is go and score some speed. And, you, you know, you can sort of see where this is going, right? Next thing, I'm like scoring a bit more speed. Then I'm like, I'm, I was on like benefits. Something that was like 80 quid a fortnight or something. I'm spending 70 quid of that on speed. I'm keeping nine quid towards paying my bills. And I've got a pound, I think I had like one pound 80 to spend for my fortnightly shop, right? Anyway, because I didn't have that much money for drugs and I, I, I never sold drugs, it wasn't like I had an endless supply in my pocket. They would last me what I could afford for about four, three or four nights. And then bang, I would literally crash where I was I'd be raging I was injecting drugs up to like 12 times a day when it ran out because I had no more the tiredness would finally like come over me like a like a tidal wave the drugs wouldn't be able to hold that tidal wave back and I'd crash and I'd wake up two days later wherever it was when that tidal wave it was lucky it was lucky I wasn't in fucking Tesco's or something right um and of course, what came with that chronic depression, the sort of depression I'd never known. I was directionless, didn't know where to go, didn't know where my life was going, felt I had nothing to offer an employer. I was an elite Royal Marines commando and I felt like I had, I had nothing. On top of that, I got some real hairy situations with the triads while working for them and obviously i was in psychosis for on and off for three or four months um which is traumatic enough in itself plus i've got all my childhood shit which i've i've never you know i never dealt with it because i never really realized i had it until i started to get involved in drugs and 
you're thinking, you know, you think a lot more. And so cut long story short, that was my first experience of depression, but I didn't know what it was because no one comes up to you or certainly back like this is 20 years ago. No one like comes up to you and goes, Chris, you're depressed, mate. That's what it is. And by the way, three nights off your head on drugs ain't helping you, mate. Right. So that was that. Now, I can honestly say I've never got depressed in my life since then, except when I have a binge, which is quite few and far between now. Um, but, you know, it's petered off over the years. It went to like drugs. Well, over in a booze binge? Uh, booze doesn't get me doesn't bring on the depression it's the class a's or what what you know whatever 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 that form that might be sometimes it's been pain medication um but here was the thing i got myself out of the country i did a charity fire walk to raise money to go and and study in this school in norway that then would send me to africa as a volunteer worker and for the first time ever I went away and I, was de- I knew I was depressed because I knew what to look for now, right? I've been sober for 20 years. I haven't had a drink for 20 years. In that period, there was a period of time for a year where I relapsed on a certain substance. Um, when I was 19, something happened to me one evening where I woke up the next day and thought, oh, I'm an alcoholic and I'm an addict. I didn't do anything about it for another two to three years. I have mainly been a sober person for a majority of my life. Where I am now as a 46 year old is content. I don't, there's no binge. You know, I think the last bastion of negative addictions for me that I can't cope with is food. And I've sort of, I'm getting that down. I'm uh, managing that. I'm managing that addiction. What I was thinking over the last couple of weeks in this slipstream that I find myself in of sobriety is the delusion of our reality when we were growing up. How old are you? 50 now. Okay. So the school doors close and the pub doors open. And as simple as we breathe, we just walk into those pubs and it's a lottery whether you survive them or not. Mm. What it's becoming apparent to me is there doesn't have to be that paradigm. The paradigm that you, you, you get your entertainment and you deal with life from numbing yourself. You know, I, I, I'm just, I don't want to do anything about it. I'm just finding it interesting as a sober person of 46 to go, yeah, we didn't need to do that. Mm. But it was just the, it was just the route the river was taking you, you know? Um, And I've got four kids and I, and they're all young. My oldest is seven. The youngest is three months old. And I wonder how, they are going to approach that particular phase of their life and how I'm going to approach that particular phase of their lives with them. Mm. Cause I, 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 I don't know about you, right? Mm. And I know this sounds crazy to some, it might not. I think drugs are like the equivalent of a Ouija board and you don't know what you're opening up. And I think that when people talk about demons and sorting out their demons, I think they're actual demons. I've had this very conversation, yeah, with my with my partner. Yeah, when you when 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 opiates get you, and that that ain't nice. That is not nice because you're not just do- dealing with a mental, you know, a mental addiction then you're dealing with a physical one that you have got to go through pain to get off this stuff now either that or 
wean yourself down so gradually that that the the pain you know is uh, the pain is sort let of me, bearable let me tell you the greatest hits of the worst time i've ever had with drugs are painkillers mm. oh when it comes to drugs yeah, it's the angels, my song, of the greatest hits that have been the most problematic. Nothing is a day trip or a walk in the park, but pain medication is fucking evil. Yeah. Evil and legal, just like alcohol, you know. And meanwhile, you know, the, um, the people that own the patent for those pain medications are, are currently living in 50,000 square foot houses. Mm. Yeah. And uh, you know, that's, that's one of six while uh, America succumbs to its own epidemic, mm. its own pandemic. Um, yeah, it's scary. Mm. Yeah. Well, that whole, the whole opiate epidemic, particularly in the States, is, I mean, it's an act of, if, if people want to use terms like the devil, if that's how they frame things, that's an act of the devil. I mean, they, they convinced a whole kind of, from what I understand, a whole community of general practitioners, so, so your doctor, that this medication um, is just as harmless as, you know, taking an aspirin or taking an ibuprofen or something, right? So the doctors then prescribed it willy-nilly and we've got this situation that we're in now. It all gets so much more complicated because when you get addicted to a prescription medication, you're then in a position where you've got to fake your illness or extend, you know, to extend it because the alternative is having to admit to your GP that you think you've got a problem with it. That's problematic even in itself because we live in a society where there's just so much denial anyway. Um, and you don't want to tell your GP because it might then affect your work or he might turn around and say, right, go down, go down to the, uh, you know, the drug center, the addiction treatment center. And if you're, let's say, you know, you just use a stereotype, some middle class person who works in a, a bank or a solicitors and you got to rock up down at the methadone clinic. It's, it, you know, it all gets na nasty, doesn't it? Well, here's the thing. Somebody might be watching this that's actually currently medicated that mm. knows exactly what we're talking about. And I would say to them, um, there is a, there is a new reality that you can step into. It isn't easy. And uh, while you wean yourself off those things, you feel like the pain and the discomfort is never gonna end. Uh, but the truth is it does. Uh, and uh, the other side is freedom. I think it's important that people know that. Uh, do know that it does feel like it isn't gonna end. It will. Exactly. Couldn't have put it better myself. You know, this is yeah. what I said to you earlier about um, living in paradise. It's, in, you know, which, which for me is in, in here. I've traveled, mo I've traveled most of the world and it's not a place you, I've seen some nice places. But, um, I think, I also think that uh, for me, the new normal and the new paradise is content. You know, that, that's, what, that what, that's what speaks to me in this position that I, I am with the work that I've done on myself. You know, we've been to places that only Superman is inhabited. So we think that's normal. It's not, you know. For me, my paradise right now is not being in pain and is feeling content. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the sort of, 
a rebalancing of the Richter scale. You know, I often say to people, rate your day, 10 being orgasmic and one being suicidal. And uh, I just think we need to rejig the scale, you know, because what I'm expecting as a 10, I can't inhabit that place unless I become a monk and meditate daily for weeks and weeks and weeks and years and years and years. But I can inhabit a different 10, my 10. Um, do you know what I'm saying? Yes, very much. I think when I use the word paradise, maybe it sounds a bit too powerful, a bit, bit too sort of idyllic. I, I, because content, I could, I could, e I could equally substitute paradise with content. I think I use the word paradise because, like, I genuinely love this planet. I really do. I mean, I'd love the universe, but I don't, I don't think I'm going to see much of it. But effectively, my bottom dollar is we're carbon molecules, right? That's what we're made of, the same as, yeah, you know, everything else. And as such, we're a part of the universe. And when you think of it like that, that means we've always been here and we will always be here because we're just molecules. When, when this life form finishes, this form that people like to label Chris Frule will disintegrate, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I will then be in the birds and the plants and, and the bees for, for, you know, for the next you know, the next phase of this set of molecules. Well, the first thing that, that thinking that way does is it, it takes away your fear of death because you can't go anywhere. Even if you wanted to, you can't go anywhere. Yeah, you, I, you know, I wrote a lyric and it said, uh, I'm not scared of dying. I just don't want to. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Yeah. You know, I think I did uh, that the other day, actually, because I think it really resonated with me. Yeah, uh, it, it's from, from a song of mine called Come Undone. Um, yeah, this is an avatar, you know, you, the, the Chris, the Robbie Williams. Mm. I believe this is an avatar. I, I say I believe. I think I have a knowing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I think I have a knowing. A lot of the time I don't trust that knowing because... We have been um, indoctrinated into the cult of understanding that has been forced. Oh. The brainwashing is very powerful and very, very seductive, and it works. Now, I'm either mad or I know some shit. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you've just lost your um, your video. I can still hear you, so let's continue. Um, yeah, no, I yeah, think I think continue. you know. I think you yeah. know some shit, Rob. That's it's just you can't you can't go through what we've been through. Um, for me, it's a bit like yeah, but do but here, here, okay, let me let me ask you this. But do we? Are we not? You know because. I'm picking up from you that you and I, same thing that people call research, right? And is it research or are we just watching videos on YouTube and are we stuck in an echo chamber? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. Do you ever ask yourself the question, are we, is this a simulation? Is this just some... Hey, mate, I asked myself that. I, I, was, I was nine years old. I was on a BMX. I was outside Port Vale Stadium, and I was by myself, and I had this overwhelming sense that none of this is real. Mm -hmm. And I was absolutely terrified, and I pedaled home as quick as my legs could carry me, and I didn't mention it. Mm -hmm. I still feel the same. I'm not scared about it. Yeah, I, 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 I've, I, I've had that feeling. I had, a, I had this weird, I don't know if it was a dream, but when I was a kid, I dreamt for some reason I was walking along this wall, then all of a sudden everything went white. 
and I just kind of feeling that and the kind of aura if you could describe the aura it was like that's it it's over and now when I look back at it I think was I imagining like all out new you know a nuclear holocaust that's what as an adult you you would have described of what i what i experienced um i don't know this that, that, is a, a, sorry a, that triggers a thought for me because my my first memory of being a child we lived in a pub until i was four years old so i can differentiate when my memory started my first memory is astral projection you know, in, in dream state, um, floating off around the town. So that's my first memory. Um, you're, you're saying that's it, it's over. Was that nuclear holocaust? Um, it's interesting. Mm, yes. But another thing about me, though, is I don't, I don't really read too much in, you know, it's like we're never going to find all the answers in life, and I'm quite happy about about oh, that. But I'm having fun connecting the dots, though. Yeah, it, it is. It's interesting, and it certainly takes you to a place where I don't think that many people arrive at in their however many years on this planet. I mean, you go through phases as well as... Um, You know, it's a journey, isn't it? And like any journey, you can you can feel quite lonely on it at times. You can, at other times, you can feel companionship when you meet a, you know, a kindred spirit. Um, guess the internet is quite good in that respect because no longer, I don't know. At the one hand, you learn a lot of stuff over the internet that you probably would never have learned if if we didn't have it. But then on the other hand, you can connect with people that, that have come to the same conclusions as you. So I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, like social media on a whole, I think is a bad thing. But I've been able to connect with you instantaneously. And this has happened in a matter of hours. Mm -hmm. So there is good that comes out of it, too. I do uh, Instagram live stuff. At the moment, I'm doing this thing called Corona Oki, where I take requests and I sing to people. But in the past, I've uh, gone live with people, random people, and chatted with them. The amount of spirit that I picked up just talking to people on Instagram Live has been incredible. The amount of people that I talk to that are carers, that are nurses, that are fans of mine, that like what I do. In fact, I only kind of speak to people that care for things and and the earth and other people mm. and um for for that alone i'm glad that social media exists um but then there's the the negativity that's very very powerful that um people you know it's an energy and i have ability to um, join in with that energy too it's only because of the position that i'm in that i suppose i don't otherwise i'd be throwing callous dismissive disparaging shameful judgmental opinions too out into the universe willy-nilly i think mm. but because i am the recipient of um those uh that abuse um I know what it feels like, so I don't do it. But I guess that if I was Rob that was in Stoke-on-Trent that hadn't been lucky enough to audition for Take That and get in, I'd be doing the same thing. Uh, which is why your musings about John Fashionu and Tony Baliu were inspirational because it's the antithesis of what I was reading on Twitter, you know. You're talking about John Fashionu, that's um, an orphan, already fucked, and then suffering racial abuse every day. A society telling them that they are less than, that they're not good enough, that they are different. And then, you know, as an adult, 
he chokes out Locksmith from Rudimental and everybody thinks he's a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a journey. There's a journey from there's a journey from there to that, which is why your musings about it was very inspirational at a time when we need more of that. We need more empathy. And I, 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 I you know, it's like I'm not um, saintly. I suffer with the same sort of judgments and uh, uh, shade and freude, enjoying other people's misfortunes and having people feel like they're bigger and better than me. So I have to tear them down in my head. Um, I know that about me. I don't actively do that, but I know I'm capable of that because I, I think that's part of the human journey too. But I don't enjoy, you, enjoy that about my... For you though, Rob, you've been in an industry where, Jesus, you have got to work so hard to get to the top and then to stay there, right? There must be so much conditioning that goes on in your mind through having been through that process, right? The same, for well, example, if I'd stayed in the Marines for the 22 year career that some people do, I'd be a lot more kind of, you know, a marine kind of guy thinking, you know, thinking this way and maybe using the cliches that you hear, um, kind of when I see cliches, the kind of things people say to justify war and this kind of thing. Um, well, I, you know, I'm surrounded by people in the forces, special boat service, uh, so that's what SBS, uh, yeah. Marines, Army, um, and I love them. Mm. A very, very, very special people, you know, uh, they look after me and um, yeah, I, I, I love them to bits. There is a sort of knowing that they have and an understanding. And I, I, I think also all of them that I've worked with over the past 30 years, there's no chip. Mm. There's no chip on the shoulder because they've, they've done it. They don't, they don't, they're not, they're not sort of, they don't have to be the big I am because they were the big I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, it's like the SAS Who Dares Wins program, isn't it? When you see them go in their little gaggle in their hut and they have to discuss the, um, I'm going to call them contestants, but the, the selectees, I suppose we'd call them. They're really quite nice about them, aren't they? they it's almost like they care and they want, and that's what the Marines is like. In, in training, they, you might be put through your paces and you, you might get, bark, you don't get barked at a lot in the Marines. It's not sort of like you, you'd experience in the army, for example, some sergeant major just shouting at you like you're, a, you know, you're a nothing. But you do get shouted at at times and you get what you call beasted, which is just severe kind of physical endurance like uh, exercise, which is put on you as a form of punishment. But it's all that's to serve to, to you know, to create a fighting machine at the end of the day that, that follows orders obviously when they're told, but behind the scenes, they're, they're, they're quite thoughtful people and they'll sit down and say, right, this, this recruit through, he's good at this. He's good there. What do we think about that? How can we kind of, you know, encourage him to get better there? And yeah, so I can imagine your, your security boys are of that kind of ilk. And special forces guys are really cool. They're not what people think they are. Um, if you see my chat with Colin McLaughlin, he's a really just an absolute gentleman. Yeah. Um, there is a, there's an empathy in that show, the beasting and the shouting, and then the, uh, the you know, the cuddle. But the um, empathic nature of, of what they see in human beings is um, incredible. There isn't another show on TV that has, that I know, that isn't a therapy kind of show that shows the other side of human nature. 
or talent shows or reality TV shows. None of them have that moment where they try and understand the person that's in front of them. Yeah. No, you're quite right. The other thing I kind of like, we don't watch, I don't watch mainstream TV per se, but the two things I watch, one is the SAS program. It's my duty to watch. And Foxy's a really nice guy. He's going to be the patron of my charity bike ride next year. I'm going to mountain bike across America. And Foxy's agreed to be the patron and we're going to try and raise awareness of this alarming rate of veteran suicide, which I've done on a couple of my charity stunts before. Um, so yeah, so I like to watch it from that perspective. But the other one, funnily enough, is I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. And when you see these celebrities put in the jungle and for the first, you know, one or two days there, they've got their celebrity head on. And then when, after that, you start to see the cracks and the human nature coming out and the real, um, the real them. And what I really like is the way that they've gone through this, what do they call it? Uh, forming, storming, norming and reform, reforming this, this process that, that the psychology of human beings when they're put together in groups. And I like it when they really bond at the end and they've got used to each other's kind of foibles and faux pas and all that sort of thing. And, and they're a real solid unit and they've achieved and they've overcome their obstacles and their fears and yeah so that's kind of the other mainstream program talking about mainstream stuff what i did straight away in this lockdown was rid myself of mainstream the mainstream media uh news mm. because i i understood that it was um inflaming my panic and paranoia and fear almost like there's a psychic attack and um i instantly went okay why don't we take this moment to adjust and reframe where you are putting your energy and yeah. i used to put my energy before this started in headlines and um I knew that I shouldn't, but I was compelled to do it. For seven weeks, I haven't um, clicked a headline or read the news. I also don't really watch the TV, um, apart from a few odds and sods, but I'm on YouTube all the time. <laughs> Probably a bit like this me. Is, this, is, this is where I get my news. Yeah. Well, it's the it's the it's the certainly the better way. Although, obviously, this platform is becoming more and more censored. Um, probably. Oh, which 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 reminds me, which I want to get onto. So we're all watching the same videos. We're all coming up to the same conclusions. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm on the other side of the veil, right? I'm on the other side of the curtain, and um, just for context. Um, you know, sold 80 million albums, sold 10 million tickets for people to come see me. It was the biggest artist on the planet for two years, maybe three years. And I say this not for ego, just for context. Hey, right? Rob, you, you can say what you like, mate, because you've thoroughly deserved it. And you've. Well, well, bless you. Thanks, Chris. But there's a reason that I'm saying this, right? Because this is what I'm worried about. And it's. Um, discernment and the echo chamber that we find ourselves in, right? You would think that the platform that I was given and have, that I would have heard something, know something, or been invited to something, right? Hmm. I can tell you, on my children, I know nothing. Haven't been invited, haven't heard. The only thing that I ever heard about was what everybody else heard about. And I heard about that when I wasn't famous was Jimmy Savile, mm. right? So this is what I'm saying to you. And it's really important because we're coming up with our own conclusions, but we're also magnifying our own thoughts and theories. And the maths is off. 
Mm. Do, do you know what I'm saying? And yeah, it's... I, I do because I, yeah. I, I, tell, I, I tell you, I tell you, you know, everybody's saying, you know, this and, and this and all of these things and Hollywood's in on it and everybody is in on it. It's not true. Mm. You know, it's not true. You know, everybody's not in it, in on it. I'm not saying that there aren't people that are. I don't know. But you would have thought I would have heard something. And that's what I'm saying. It's sort of like, look, I was bread fed, breast fed red pills. But the reason why I don't indulge this outside of you and other people that I talk to is because there is a chance that you could become a red pillock. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Oh, exactly. I think it's why a lot of people get to a certain point, Rob, and then they just pull back because it, it all gets into the realm of subjectivity. Yeah. You know, and you do, you think, hang on a second. There's Rob there in Los Angeles. He's got a beautiful wife. He's got four gorgeous kids. He's, he's, He's trying to get by, you know, like ev like everybody else is. Um, really, has he got time to be going to meetings and, you know, drinking the blood of children and all this kind of stuff, right? I, I, I would say right here and now, I wouldn't dismiss anything. Um, Me neither. Me neither. Yeah. And I say that because yeah it, it it's fascinating why then why all the symbolism what what is who listen i'm down for symbolism will be their downfall yeah i'm down for that. but you who know? actually gets it in the in the in the videos and the and the and the, and the songs no, and no, 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 let me tell you let me tell you you know the zeitgeist of the moment is this talk for certain people, right? What popular culture does and pop music does is regurgitate what it's receiving and present it back to you. Now, I myself, like I remember when I did um, the shame video with Gary Barlow, I put on a Masonic um, ring because I wanted to, I wanted to wind people up, you know, I wanted to, um, you know, prod them <laughs> and take the piss. What people, and I, in my lyrics, I've put in things that those will know will understand and those that don't, it just passes them by. The reason that I've put them in is because I'm going, hey, I'm interested in this. That's what I'm doing mm. is I got, I'm interested in this. I think there's something in it. And then I sort of, I suppose that it's sort of like for me, sending out an all points bulletin going, are you picking this up too? Are you receiving this too? You know, and I wonder if that's what other people are doing because that's what I'm doing. You know, it's like, I, I've got, I've got lyrics out there that are really dark that people don't know are dark. Mm. You know? And what I don't want is that to come back and kick me in the ass and have people think I'm one of them because that's really dangerous. Mm -hmm. mm. That's really, really dangerous. You know, and, and we know with, I won't say the words, but you know, if you like a dough based um, food, with a uh, dairy topping on it you know what i'm saying uh, you know you know that there, there's sort of like this the the this sort of out of control red pilling can come back and bite a lot of people in the ass and there's a lot of people pointing at people and they don't know hmm. they don't know we've all we've all heard the same youtube documentaries and mm. talks, but nobody fucking knows. It, 
Yeah. I think Sean Atwood is. Uh, I love Sean. Yeah, he's a good guy. Good guy, Sean. But I think he probably sums it up in that there's there's probably a lot of competing agendas in the world. Um, I mean, it's hard to. It, it, I genuinely don't know how much you can talk about this stuff especially on a platform like YouTube. I know you can't. You, you know, can't. You know and, and, and I say this a lot. I don't maybe think this is the platform because there's no point having a YouTube channel and working your ass off, which is what you have to do to, to make it work. To have it demonetized. Yeah, just to, have, just, to, just to have it taken away from you. And it's interesting. I mean, David Icke puts a lot of stuff out there on his YouTube and you do it does make you wonder how and i'm not not suggesting anything for one minute but it just makes you wonder how he gets away with it uh, yeah me too but let, can i also state for the record this is not a hill that i want to die on either you know i don't want to become the face of this mm. you know it's like I, i'm um i'm a interested bystander that's connecting dots too. Hmm. But I, I'm not I'm not here to lead a charge because I have as much truth as everybody else does. And I don't even know if it's true. Hmm. You know? It, again, it comes down, do you ever find yourself wondering if this is all just part of your bizarre reality? This, this, because it, it, it's- um, this, this is what I'm saying is, it's so are we real. in an echo? Are we in an echo chamber that mm. makes us feel good about our own psychosis? Mm. Yeah. Which is why I can't. Which is why I can't die on this hill. Mm. You know, because I understand myself enough to understand that I don't understand myself. Mm. You know, and I feel uncomfort. I feel discomfort. Have I created my own reality? where these things are possible you know that's so i i'm you know i i have to stand outside of myself and have a look at it objectively as objectively as i can hmm. yes yes i tell you what though it's a fucking field day for conspiracists right now isn't it with this that's going on it's like we've <laughs> we've pulled the one arm bandit and it's come in sevens. You know, it's just it's I it's like this, right? Sometimes it's tempting to think, hang on, am I am I drawing false conclusions here? You know, does it, it, it is is this all circumstantial? And I'm I don't mean me person, but people that have that kind of interest. I draw it, are making too much of it, right? But then, let's be honest, you, if, you, if you go back, if I can just say the events in New York, then it, it's undeniable. Well, I can't deny it to myself, Rob, that something's fucking going on, right? Um, you know. I'm some, suspicious. Oh yeah, I'm highly suspicious, but yeah. there you go. I mean, it, it, yeah, I think for a lot of us, we're just way past that stage of, of was it, is it? it it's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm saying this because I'd be unfair to all those kind people out there that have spent thousands of hours dedicating their lives to exposing the truth. There was one gentleman I saw, um, they FedExed, his brother back to him in, a, in boxes bit by bit as they found him in the Twin Towers, right? Um, and just to think these fuckers got away with that, Rob, and they're still getting away with it. Um, you know, there's a, there's a line in the sand and for me it's, do I want to live as a, a coward or do I want to live as a lion? And there's only one answer to that. And just for that, people like that guy who had his brother FedEx back to him in bits as they found, 
you know, one box would contain part of this scalp. Um, and yeah, I guess- I tell you, I tell you what I do find interesting is the, uh, the acceleration of information, you know, where you would sort of have to wait for 18 months before a, let's call it a dump, you know. The speed of which truths are happening right now is accelerating to the point where the awakening is upon us or we're deluding ourselves yet again. Hmm. With this current situation, I don't want to talk like specifics and it's also I don't want to alarm people but then to the other side of the coin, haven't they been alarmed by what the media has told them already? As you said, it, it was scary, right? Well, I haven't had any of that fear at all. And it's really simple. It's because I don't believe a single... That's my wife. <laughs> this is Chris. Oh, hi, Chris. Hi, Ada. How are you? I'm sweaty and stinky, but you can't smell me on, on Zoom or Skype. So <laughs> Mwah. We're talking some deep stuff. You're talking deep stuff. Yeah, I love you, babe. I love you, babe. I'm gonna take my body top off and get some food. Oh, okay. In our makeshift room before here. Okay. Um, yeah, but it's 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 fascinating, and um, I'm a student um, of figuring out my own psychology, really. Do you not um, feel, uh, uh, Rob, do you not feel a victim yourself of our media? I absolutely. Mean, I mean, when, when I get a young man comes to me and says, Chris, can you life coach me? I feel like this in my life. Or I feel that I want to achieve this. But and, Look, and the, narrative, the narrative of who I am has been dictated by people um that gaslight in positions of immense power you know oh, and uh, and you know uh perception is uh is everything you know who i am what i stand for what i actually believe how i actually feel is not out there there is a cartoon character but to be honest with you 30 years of this, my arse is so numb, I hardly feel the cock when it goes in. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, okay, okay, that's, that's happening again. But, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's that sort of thing that you were talking about, like the power of forgiveness. And you, you were talking about how you're, able to forgive i really struggle with that i wrote a song i wrote a song last night actually about uh, forgiveness and um i wrote the lyric happy with the lyric i don't believe what i'm singing <laughs> because i i i struggle with i i often think that the power that motivates me to become the person that i am and carrying on being the power that i am also comes from people's disdain, hate, and uh, lacerations, and you know, hate, just hate. Mm -hmm. You know, that's been a potent force in the making of me, both ways. Mm -hmm. A, for my psychology and how I feel about myself, but B, for what I've achieved. Yeah. But I find it very difficult, I find it very difficult to forgive. I think if the other person or people come to the table at the same place as I am, I find it incredibly easy to forgive. Mm. It's so easy, you know, but if they don't, I carry on in this drinking the poison, expecting somebody else to die sort of thing. Yeah, well, that's massively how it is. Um, see, for me, it's, actually, it's probably quite a, a it's not a selfish thing per se, but if you want to achieve enlightenment, which 
I, I would suggest everybody gives that a go. It's like if you're in the, the marble championship of the universe and you've got your pot of marbles, all the time you've got an axe to grind with someone or you haven't forgiven them or, or, or you know, they're, they're arousing these emotions in you. It's like you've taken some of your marbles out and you're putting them in their pot and then you're wondering why you're why you're not winning the you know the marble championship okay. of the universe, right? Yeah, so I get it. It's, it's like forgive them, forget it. You know, if it's the bullies at school is an example. A lot of people come, or you know, something a lot of people suffer from. Forgive them. They was probably victimized, bullied, come from broken homes themselves. They, if you met them today on the street, would probably be the first to apologize forget it and th this is kind of what i say um and yeah but it's only because that it's it goes back to what you were saying before it comes back to empathy again to to understand everybody is to forgive everybody is a saying that i saw and was like yeah out. you know it's like yeah if you understood everybody you'd forgive them mm. It's not, it's, I, I think a lot of people listening, I, or I know because I've said this before on podcasts, I think I said it on Sean's podcast, it's not a weak, it's not a weakness, it's not about, you know. No, it's, uh, that was one of the lyrics, one of the lyrics was, uh, I'm not giving up, I'm letting go. Yeah, it's a strength, it's a strength of character to understand, to empathise with other people's situation, to see why they behaved in the way they did just to let it go um so yeah <laughs> hope that helps somebody listening but going back to the media I, no, no, it helped me it helped me you know it's like i'm like a fucking rottweiler with that stuff i just won't let it go it's um another lovely quote i heard this the other day it's like lift the weights in your own gym <laughs> no. Yes. Don't don't be at the window of your gym looking at the gym across the road going, oh, they got nice dumbbells. It's fuck yeah. that shit. You lift the weights in your own gym. You do the workout here. You know, it's it's stop. You know, stop. Hey, mate. Listen, I need to go for a pee, and I also need to get some food. Hmm. <laughs> well, it's been amazing talking to you. Hasn't it been great? Yeah. I've loved it. I I knew that we would instantly have um a, an understanding also you know it's like I've, i'm kind of sitting on the sidelines watching things occur and seeing the same youtube clips knowing things knowing certain things are just like batshit crazy but also knowing that there's a lot of truth in there you know it's it's been nice to get this off my chest Mm -hmm. to go just fucking pause for poise man don't die on that hill because we haven't got the facts we haven't got the facts the the amount of bullshit that has been created in the places that we go to over the less last, last seven weeks because of what's happened in the last seven weeks that remain unfulfilled that remain not happening that remain no proof of, but people are fucking sure that it's truth. Guys, just it's a back, lot back it, down a little bit. It makes sense that a lot of it's smoke and mirrors, though, isn't it? A lot of it's fabricated to, to purposely take people off the the, re, the real agenda on the planet. Yeah, I suppose that could be true too, because, yeah, how do you controlling the enemy would be the first task i would have thought the people and listen if they exist and they're as as smart as we believe them to be why wouldn't they be in control of this narrative too that's what we <laughs> well, they're not you know if they exist they're not just going to sit there going oh shit <laughs> they're going to get smart yeah, well, they are smart. They've been doing this for thousands of, you know, since the days of the pyramids. And, uh, and uh, they... It they... may, Chris, if they have. Oh, they have. You know, we, yeah, I, look, 
<laughs> I'm as I think that that is true. I have a belief that that is true. Would I die on that hill and worship at the church of that? I don't know if I would. I'm not as sure as you. Well, it's at the end of the day, um, I say to everybody, you get one life. If you live it right, one is enough. And I, I don't let this get to me. I'm not afraid of anything. Rob, you know, I, I'm just, I'm not afraid. I'm like I said, I'm carbon molecules. What, what can happen to me? Well, I go back to this beautiful universe that I love anyway. So I'm not, that's, that's a good deal for me. Um, but while I'm in this form, while I've got this kind of, uh, this, this, uh, vehicle to experience which is life experiencing itself, right? I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to have the best time possible. I'm going to smile. I smile at the sun every morning and I thank I, uh, this, this form of me, thanks mother nature for, for giving me another day on this beautiful planet. I've had three of my, three of my best friends now die from two drank themselves to death and one uh, drowned on when we took LSD and so it's you know it's all very very real for me you know and that devil that you talked about is we, we, even if we're talking in metaphorical terms or literary I'm terms, not. no I know I know I, I know that yeah I know that I know that feeling Rob I know it when you wake up in the night, you think he's got me again, isn't he? He's got me again. And this is why we fight the good fight, you know? This is why we believe in ourselves. This is why we have to have ultimate self-love. This is why we love every, everybody, every other being on this planet. Oh, mate, listen, I love people. Love people. Mm -hmm. I That's love obvious. connections. You know, I love connections. Uh, I love empathy. I love compassion. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in love with the planet. I'm in love with its people. Um, which is weird because I'm an agrophobe. <laughs> but but there's, there's the dichotomy. Anyway, listen, much love to you. Peace yeah. to you, brother. Love Peace you too, mate. You. Okay, lots of love. Keep yeah. in contact. Let's keep this conversation going. I look forward to that. All right, brother. You take care. You too, brother. Cheers, cheers. Oh, Keep talking, they'll come. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, Thank you. They're, they're coming in droves at the minute and I've only got, uh, you know, love to give. So thank you, Robbie. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall. I'm a former Royal Marines Commando and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now, I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life, and if you live it right, one is enough.